program here at the Commonwealth Club. And I'd like to welcome our online audience, our live stream audience, and all of those of you who uh, will watch this later on video podcast. So uh, this is one of our many programs that we've been bringing since the virus uh, shut down our operations at the uh, 110 Market Marcadero in San Francisco. And we have done a couple hundred programs already. And tonight uh, we're going to uh, go back to Adam Hochschild. We, we had a program with him uh, six months ago or so. And uh, this time we're going to talk about one of his books, the latest book, Rebel Cinderella. Um, I'm sure lots of you are very familiar with Adam's work. Um, prolific writer, award-winning writer, and uh, really uh, has picked quite a few projects about humane subjects, about how we deal with human life uh, in a way which has been very, very, uh, well, very intriguing and uh, hopefully uh, ed- enlightening and educating for some. So, Adam, um, your latest book, Rebel Cinderella, uh, about a now unknown but at the time extremely famous woman. Rose Pastor Stokes. Um, why don't you, uh, you, you have a, a, a whole presentation about this, so why don't we just sit back and have you run us through it. And welcome back to the Commonwealth Club. Well, thank you, George. It's good to be here, and I'm grateful to have a chance to talk about my latest book. I'm going to show you some slides about it, and then I'd be happy to hear your questions after that. Uh, let me share my screen here. Uh, You should be seeing a picture of the book cover on the screen. Let me know if you're not. And let me find It's there. Good. All right. Let me find where I can advance the slides. Okay. Good. All right. Um, Most of this book is about the woman in this picture, Rose Pastor Stokes, a remarkable but today forgotten figure but it's also about her unusual marriage, a marriage which is a window, I hope, onto life in this country as it was more than a century ago, its hopes, its illusions, and its enormous injustices. So let me trace her story first. The woman who became Rose Pastor Stokes was born in Tsarist Russia in the town of Augustov in 1879. She was Jewish, but the Jews of Augustov, or at least some of them, did not live in a separate shtetl because we know that Rose's father, from whom her mother separated very soon after her birth, who was a cobbler, lived above his shop on this central square of the town. When Rose was born, the Russian Empire was then under the rule of Tsar Alexander II. This was the reformer czar, the czar who freed the serfs. He also eased a few of the very severe restrictions on Russia's Jews. Uh, Alexander was by no means a human rights activist, but he was considerably less anti-Semitic than many others in the Romanov dynasty. However, the lives of Rose and her family and millions of others were upended by an event that came two years after her birth, hundreds of miles away, in St. Petersburg, the empire's capital. Tsar Alexander II was assassinated. And as soon as he was dead, his successor imposed harsh new restrictions on Russia's Jews. And then there were a series of pogroms over the next 25 years. Hundreds of peoples were killed, often Jewish homes and shops were burned, leaving their owners homeless. And this, of course, was what spurred the great exodus of millions of Jews from the Russian Empire. And among them was Rose, then three years old, and her divorced mother. They stayed first for seven years in London, living in great poverty in the city's East End. And while there, Rose had the only formal schooling she ever had, less than two years. But it was enough for her to learn to read and write in English and to discover a great love for English poetry. When she was 11 years old in 1890, she and her mother came to the United States, like so many millions of others on packed immigrant ships like this one. They went to Cleveland, Ohio. There, Rose immediately had to go to work in a factory making cigars. 
uh, 11 years old. This is the first known picture of her taken in 1896. She's third from the left in the back row, uh, 16 years old at the time. She worked in cigar factories for a dozen years. By the end of that time, she was supporting herself, her mother, and six younger siblings who had been abandoned by a ne'er-do-well stepfather. Uh, she worked often in the evenings as well as during the day, earned $8 a week, equivalent to about $240 today, which is not much on which to support a family of that size. And rolling cigars was hard work. The oil and the tobacco seeped into your clothes, your skin. It was almost impossible to get rid of the smell. The air in cigar factories was kept very humid. The windows were nailed shut even in summer because if the air got too dry, it dried out and made brittle the so-called wrapper leaves, which wrapped the outer side, outside of the cigar. And the whole time, very, very fine tobacco dust filled the air and workers' lungs. Uh, cigar workers had the second highest rate of tuberculosis in the United States. Only stone cutters had it worse. And Rose would have lung problems as long as she lived. When she was 21 years old, something happened that changed her life. A neighbor brought the family a copy of a Yiddish newspaper published in New York, the Yiddish's Tageblatt, or Jewish Daily News. The paper was published in New York, but it was trying to go national. It ran one page each issue in English, and it invited contributions from readers around the country. Send us your stories, your anecdotes, your poems, whatever. Rose began sending in material, uh, to the paper in English. Uh, I'm happy that she wrote for the English page because I don't read Yiddish. Uh, <laughs> and she began sending articles, poems, stories. And one day she was amazed to receive a check in the mail for $2, realizing that she could be actually be paid for her writing. She began writing a column called Just Between Ourselves Girls, a kind of a flippant advice column. Uh, under the pen name of Zelda. She was even more amazed when after doing this for two years, the newspaper invited her to New York to work for it full-time as a reporter for the, its English language page at double the salary she'd been earning as a cigar worker. So she arrived in New York in 1903, 23 years old. And imagine how amazing that city looked to somebody then who was really seeing it for the first time. Skyscrapers like none she'd ever seen before, elevated trains puffing along above the streets like this one, uh, trolleys uh, on the streets below pulled by cables underneath the street like the cable cars in San Francisco, an enormous subway network being built but not yet open and even on the streets, some of the remarkable new horseless carriages. Now, New York was a city that would have terrified Donald Trump because it was a city of immigrants. More than half the men over 21 in Manhattan, for example, were foreign born. New York would soon be the largest city in the world. It was already the largest Jewish city on earth. This is a picture of the Lower East Side, the area where Rose lived and worked. And most of what she wrote for the newspaper were feature stories and interviews with people like this, uh, the peddlers who worked on the streets, the shop assistants and proprietors in places like that butcher shop uh, behind them. Uh, however, one day in the summer of 1903, uh, after she, just before her 24th birthday, after she'd been in New York for about six months, the newspaper editor gave her a different kind of assignment, which was to go and interview somebody who worked at a settlement house on the Lower East Side. Now, you know something I'm sure about settlement houses. Mm -hmm. These were established in uh, 
slum areas in big cities around the country, especially in the Northeast, set up to provide services to poor neighborhoods, uh, childhood nu nutrition programs. Um, they provided baths and showers, not just for kids, but for adults, because these were things that didn't exist in the neighborhood tenements. Uh, they gave adult education classes in English literacy and other subjects. Now, the interesting thing about settlement houses is that they served a population that was almost entirely immigrant and poor. But the volunteers who staffed them tended to be well-to-do college graduates. This settlement house on the Lower East Side, still there today, is called the University Settlement, and that's where Rose was sent to do her interview. And here's the guy she was assigned to interview, a volunteer worker there, James Graham Phelps Stokes, called Graham by his friends. And as you can tell from the name, he was Anglo-Saxon Protestant, and he and Rose fell in love. Now, Graham Stokes came from the most different kind of background imaginable. For example, here is his family's summer home. When it was <laughs> built, it was the largest private home in the United States, a cottage, so-called, in the Berkshire Mountains of Western Massachusetts, 100 rooms. Uh, legend has it, that one of Graham's brothers, who was in the class of 1896 at Yale, sent a telegram to his mother saying, bringing some apostrophe 96 fellows home for the weekend. His mother replied by telegram, many guests already here have room only for 50. The apostrophe <laughs> got left out of the telegram. Now, if you were writing a novel, you know, where somebody who grew up in a house like this, falls in love with a poor uh, immigrant who'd been a sweatshop worker for a dozen years. Nobody would believe it, but it happened. When not at a couple of different country places like this that the family owned, they lived in New York in this mansion at Madison Avenue and 37th Street, today part of the Morgan Library. Here are Graham Stokes's parents, each of them came from sizable fortunes, which they combined. Their money came in part from the Phelps Dodge mining empire, partly from New York real estate, uh, especially uh, luxury apartment buildings on the Upper East Side, also from a cluster of gold and silver mines in Nevada and a railroad that led to them. Uh, Graham Stokes's parents had nine children, and here are they and some of their spouses and offspring in this picture. The boys in the family were expected to play prominent roles in life, and they did. One of them became a famous architect. One of them became an editorial writer for the New York Times. One of them became what today would be called provost of Yale University. A grandson became an Episcopal bishop. The girls were expected uh, to marry well, and they did. One married a nobleman and became a baroness. One married into the family of a former secretary of state. But Graham Stokes took a, and he's incidentally in this picture, he's sort of with his hands on that counter at the, at the back right. Mm -hmm. uh, he took a somewhat different path in life than any of his siblings. Uh, after graduating from college, he went to medical school. And while a medical student at Columbia in New York, uh, he worked on a horse-drawn ambulance as a medical student from Roosevelt Hospital and was exposed to a very, very different New York from the one that he'd grown up in. He was shocked by what he saw. This was the New York of the tenements, a New York where immigrants lived packed, six, seven, eight people to a room. Uh, in tenement buildings were often the only toilets were outdoor outhouses like these. Uh, tenements were not just living places in New York, but also factories, makeshift sweatshops for the city's garment industries. Um, Graham was outraged by what he saw, and that's what led him to become part of the settlement house movement. 
he and Rose courted secretly for two years. And finally, news of their engagement leaked out. And it received immense attention. Newspapers across the United States, in Europe, in Australia, everybody was fascinated by this marriage. This is page one headline from the New York Times. J.G. Phelps Stokes to wed young Jewess. Um, here it is as the lead story on the front page of the New York Evening World. And as you can see, what attracted attention was not just that this was a marriage between someone extremely rich and someone extremely poor, but between Jew and Gentile. Very, very, very unusual uh, at that time. So there was both a class and an ethnic difference between them. And that, of course, is people were fascinated by, just as we are today. You know, look at the amount of attention that gets lavished on Prince Harry and Meghan. Exactly, Martin. yeah. Uh, that same newspaper immediately signed Rose up to write a series of articles calling her the genius of the ghetto. They got married despite the well-concealed dismay of Graham's family. They got married on July 18th, 1905, Rose's 26th birthday. Graham was seven years older than she was. The press remained fascinated by them and they lived in a blaze of publicity for years. And of course, the core of the public's fascination was that here there seemed to be a Cinderella story. Prince Charming comes along and rescues poor, virtuous Cinderella from her humble hearth and brings her to live in his castle. And love, of course, will conquer all the differences between them. Here's Rose soon after they married. However, their lives did not exactly fit the Cinderella script. For Graham, to some degree, had left the castle, and Rose had no desire to live in one although they often stayed at one or another of the houses belonging to his parents, it always made her uncomfortable. She and Graham were both acutely conscious that they lived in a country with enormous disparities of wealth. Some people lived the way Graham's family did, others were desperately poor, and often worked in dangerous conditions as well, like these child coal miners in West Virginia. In 1906, the year after they married, Rose and Graham joined the group that they thought had the best answer to such problems, the Socialist Party. It was led at that time, as it was for many years, by Eugene V. Debs, a noble, much beloved man, five times a candidate for president. He had begun as leader of the Railway Workers Union, and when he campaigned for president in 1908, it was in a special train called the Red Special with red flags flying and red bunting decorating it. And engineers of passing locomotives were thrilled when they saw the Red Special coming along the opposite track and greeted him with long blasts on their whistles. Now, 1908, that year, Graham was running for office as well on the socialist ticket as a candidate for the New York State Legislature. Here he is campaigning. And he was on the platform with Debs when Debs came to New York. Uh, neither Graham nor Debs won their campaigns that year. But uh, Debs remained close to the family for some years. And people remained fascinated by this couple. Everyone still saw it as the Cinderella story. Their marriage inspired two novels. Here's one. And this particular novel was then turned into a silent film. Unfortunately, the film was lost, but we still have the promotional photos from it of the actors playing the roles inspired by Rose and Graham. What are they saying to each other here? I don't know. Your guess is <laughs> as good as mine. Uh, it was interesting in your book that, that the novel was written by friends of theirs, some of them who, who knew them, right? Yes, that's right. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't know exactly how they felt about the novel because there's mm -hmm. no surviving correspondence about that. 
Now, despite these Cinderella fantasies, uh, this was a time when millions of Americans, even those who were not living in great poverty, were becoming aware of the injustices in this country. One episode that dramatized the terrible labor conditions of the day involved clothing workers like these. It was a, a deadly fire at the Triangle Shirtwaist Company in New York, just off Washington Square. Terrible fire. Workers in the garment factories on the, on the top floors here were trapped. Most were unable to get out. There was an inadequate fire escape that collapsed under the weight of the people on it. The door to a stairwell that could have also been a means of escape was locked to keep out union organizers. 146 people burned to death or were forced by the flames to leap out the windows to their deaths. Mm -hmm. Uh, their bodies piled up on the sidewalk. Of the dead, uh, almost all were women. Half were teenagers. Almost all were immigrants, primarily Jewish and Italian. 120,000 people marched in a mourning procession through the streets of New York, and more than 300,000 people lined those streets. So as Rose continued her journalism, it was issues like this that she wrote about, of labor and social justice. She also got involved in issues of women's rights. She got involved with one case, for example, that has echoes of the kind of battles still going on today in the Me Too era. Mm -hmm. The case that drew her attention was that of a woman named Sarah Coton, who worked as a nurse for a doctor whose home and office were in the same building on New York's Upper East Side. He gave Sarah Coton a room to live in there in this building. One night, he piped chloroform under her door, and when she mm -hmm. was unconscious, he raped her. She found herself pregnant. She shot and killed the doctor and surrendered uh, to the police. Rose went to the prison where she was being held, interviewed her in Yiddish, told her story at much greater length than anyone else had, and announced to the press that she would pay Sarah Coton's legal expenses, and once she was released from prison, would give her and the baby a place to stay. The trial was delayed until Sarah Coton gave birth in prison. She was found innocent, in part because another woman assaulted by the same doctor came forward. Starting a few years after Rose and Graham married, for a decade or so, this country was convulsed by strikes with hundreds of thousands of workers walking out every year. And it was a time when labor unions had almost none of the rights that they later acquired. Strikes were often suppressed by the police. These are Chicago police arresting a striking garment worker there. Sometimes they were suppressed by troops. These are striking clothing workers in Massachusetts facing the state militia. Uh, one of the big strikes of that era was of garment workers in New York City. And if you look at the signs closely in this picture, you can see they're in four different languages, English, Italian, Yiddish, and Russian. Rose was heavily involved in this particular strike, speaking to groups of strikers, sometimes many times each day. And it was in this big New York garment workers strike, uh, begun in 1909, that Rose really came into her own as an organizer and as an immensely popular speaker. She was soon recognized as one of the great radical orators of her time, and she soon eclipsed her husband and gradually the ongoing cascade of newspaper stories were more about her than about them as a couple. And mm -hmm. there's signs that he was not completely happy about this. Uh, the most interesting strike Rose got involved in was one of hotel and restaurant workers in New York City in 1912. Organizers walked into one restaurant or hotel dining room after another, usually just as lunch or dinner was about to be served. This was all prearranged. It blew a whistle and the waiters walked out. The Waldorf Astoria, Delmonico's, the luncheon club of the New York Stock Exchange on down. Rose was on the strike committee. She addressed many rallies of striking waiters. She wrote and spoke about the miserable conditions in which many of them worked. 
And in her papers, which I spend a lot of time with, there are a lot of letters of thanks uh, from waiters. Now, one of the hotels that was hit by this strike was the Ansonia Hotel on Broadway between 73rd and 74th Street, still there today as an apartment house. Uh, it had several dining, room, dining rooms and it was a famous gathering place for musicians, show business people and mobsters. The man who owned the hotel was Graham Stokes's uncle, William Earl Dodge Stokes or Uncle Will as they called him. He was active in the eugenics movement he was a passionate hater of labor unions, immigrants, and much else. And he was absolutely furious that his beloved nephew's wife was organizing his own workers to go on strike. Mm -hmm. And he later will come back into this story. You'll see. Uh, let me turn to another aspect of Rose's and Graham's lives. Um, one of the things that made them so interesting for me to write about was their friends. They knew and worked with some of the most interesting people in the United States of that era. Here are some of them. Here's Rose with Eugene Debs on the left and behind them, Max Eastman, editor of The Masses, the best magazine of the day, in many ways, a sort of precursor of The New Yorker. They were close friends of hers. As was Big Bill Haywood, leader of the Wobblies, the industrial workers of the world, the country's most militant labor union, a former miner, cowboy, saloon card dealer, charismatic orator, famous for using his fists and for being able to recite long passages of Shakespeare by heart. They were friends with John Reed, probably the finest journalist of his generation, with Lincoln Steffens, the leading muckraker, with W.E.B. Du Bois, the greatest black intellectual of his time, with Mother Jones, Mary Harris Jones, the famous labor organizer. Rose and Graham knew all these people. Upton Sinclair, to whose novel, The Jungle, we owe our food and drug laws. As he was writing that book, he sent it chapter by chapter to Graham to get his comments. Um, I liked your, uh, just, I liked your comment in the book about Upton Sinclair being so disappointed that he had tried to move people with the jungle with their hearts. And instead he just, uh, you know, accidentally hit them in the stomach instead. And they, they right. reacted to it as a, as a, as a way to, you know, change the way they ate. <laughs> he was concerned about labor conditions and he said, right. I aim to hit the American people in their heart and I hit them in the stomach. Um, yeah. Rose and Graham were also friends with Margaret Sanger the birth control pioneer in the center in this picture. We take access to birth control for granted today, but this Brooklyn clinic where Sanger appears in the photo was shut down by the police. Sanger went to jail. Rose was active in the campaign for birth control and talked publicly about it at the time when such things were against the, when doing so was against the law. Uh, another friend, often in jail, shown here in one of her mugshots, was Emma Goldman, the anarchist firebrand. And all of these people, Rose and Graham knew and worked with. Many were their house guests at different times, and some left us their recollections of Rose and Graham. Goldman, for instance, who was always very blunt, thought Graham was a stuffed shirt and couldn't understand how Rose put up with him. So the period of American life when all these people were active was a remarkable time, a time when all of them believed that the world could be changed, that it would be changed, and that a new and more just society would be brought into being. Sadly, though, something came along that brought that period of great confidence and optimism to an end, the First World War. And that was a war that not only killed millions of soldiers and civilians, but it also shattered the radicals dream that the working classes of different countries would never fight each other. Mm -hmm. well, it was the very United interesting States. your comment, your comment in the book that it, it surprised so many of the socialist leaders that, you know, 85, 90% of their workers, you know, volunteered to go and fight. I mean, they immediately changed over. It was like a shock to them as, as the leaders. That's right. They never anticipated that. Yeah. Uh, the United States, however, did not join the war when it started. 
uh, American socialists and other radicals agitated very strongly for the U.S. to stay out of the war. And Rose and Emma Goldman and many of their friends joined something called the Women's Peace Party, which you can see demonstrating here. However, in the spring of 1917, President Woodrow Wilson went before Congress and asked it to declare war. And American troops began going to France soon in huge numbers. And by mid-1918, were heavily involved in the most fierce fighting. Here at home, the country was swept by tremendous hysteria about the war, by ferocious government propaganda, like this enlistment poster. Also by a tremendous paranoia about spies. That paranoia was directed against anti-war radicals like Rose. I don't know if you can read the caption on this cartoon, but up at the top it says, now, time, now for a roundup. And many people still felt strongly that the U.S. joining the war was a huge mistake, but they were harassed or arrested when they spoke out. The war created a rift between Rose and Graham. She became firmly convinced that it was a terrible mistake for the U.S. to join the war. Graham was so enthusiastic about the war that he enlisted and went into uniform. He was too old to get sent overseas, but he spent several years in the New York National Guard, although he never came closer to combat than marching in parades like this one in 1918 going down Fifth Avenue. Something else divided Rose and Graham that happened in late 1917, the second stage of the Russian Revolution when the Bolsheviks seized power. Rose was in favor of this, Graham was against it. And Rose continued speaking out against the war and now in favor of the Russian Revolution. This drew the rage of many people, including Graham's uncle, the angry hotel owner, which I hope you mm -hmm. remember. Here's a report about him from the files of the Bureau of Investigation, uh, predecessor of the FBI. And as you can see from the words on the screen, <clears throat> he's informing them uh, that they ought to search Rose and Graham's residence. Mm -hmm. A few days later, <clears throat> he called the Bureau, told them that Rose and Graham would be out of town, so it was a particularly good chance to search their house, and they did. The Bureau kept a close eye on Rose. Agents followed her. Stenographers transcribed her speeches. And after one anti-war speech, she was arrested. In the summer of 1918, she was put on trial, sentenced to 10 years in prison. Uh, Graham, however, put up bail money. They appealed the case. And eventually, several years later, the sentence was overturned on appeal, so she didn't actually have to go to jail. To her regret, it sounded like in your book. That's right. I think she had a sort of martyrdom streak and would have liked mm -hmm. to do some time in prison, yeah. as so many of her friends had done. Um, but by this point, their marriage was really in difficulty. They remained together for seven more years, but very uneasily so because they were going radically different directions in politics. Rose joined the Communist Party and in 1922 actually went to Russia as an American delegate to a meeting of the Communist International. And like far too many people in Russia, she thought that there she had found paradise. Graham searched for paradise in a different direction. He abandoned all his involvement in progressive politics and became deeply interested in religion, particularly in blending the traditions of Hinduism and Christianity. Finally, in 1925, they got divorced very bitterly. This put them back on the front pages for the very last time. Because as soon as they were no longer a couple, and you couldn't pretend it was a Cinderella story, the press completely lost interest in it. Mm -hmm. But happily for me, they saved all their letters. Rose kept a diary. They wrote dueling unpublished memoirs. Rose's was actually published about 50 years after her death. So there was rich, rich material to work from and to try to reconstruct their relationship and the 
ringside seat they had to a remarkable period of American history. So do historians a favor, keep your letters, write diaries, write a memoir. <laughs> Uh, after the divorce, Keep your emails, they're all in the cloud, right? That's right. Yeah. Emails are what we'll have to go on in the future. Uh, after the divorce, uh, Graham remarried, but there was no leap out of his class this time. He married the daughter of a railroad executive. He lived on to the age of 88, dying in 1960. Rose, when they got divorced, as a matter of principle, refused to accept any alimony. She was reduced to poverty again. She married uh, again, but it was to someone as poor as she was. She soon came down with cancer and died at the age of 53 in 1933. So that's their story. I wish I could say that they changed the world. They didn't, but perhaps mm -hmm. through their eyes, we can see a world that needed changing and that still does today. And I hope if you have a chance to read the book that you'll enjoy getting to know them as much as I did. Yeah, it was a, so it was a great read. Stop right there. And okay. if you've got questions, fire away. I'd be sure. Glad to hear them. So um, we won't suggest to any young people that they should uh, try to follow in their footsteps as, as a marriage. Uh, although it was, you know, as she said, even if love lasts a little while, it's still worthwhile. Um, but I think there's a, a, a big interest, obviously, in socialism. Um, and there has been when we were young. Um, there was at the time that Rose, uh, you know, was young and uh, before the communists sort of kind of ruined it by, by what they did in, in Russia. Uh, uh, obviously didn't ruin it forever, but, but gave it a bad name when everyone was so excited about what they were doing. Um, so what, what can we learn from the interest in socialism? Uh, because that's going on right now among people under 30 again, uh, and it seems to be a common recurrence. And um, why do you think this perennial hope keeps coming back? And among some people over 30 as well, I think. I yeah. think it keeps coming back because people are aware of what an enormously unequal country we live in. You know, just to take one simple measure, the gap between the share of income and wealth that's held by the top 1% in the United States and the bottom 99%. That gap is wider today than it was when Rose and Graham married in 1905. Mm -hmm. uh, today, the three wealthiest men in the country, uh, you know, Warren Buffett, Jeff Bezos, and, and Bill Gates, uh, own as much wealth as everybody else put together. And mm -hmm. Uh, you know, this, the, uh, sorry, not as everybody else put together, but as the bottom 50% of the American mm -hmm. public put, to, put together. Uh, and that inequality is only going to grow in the next, in, in the years to come, unless we go through some drastic changes. So I think this is the kind of thing that makes people interested in a vision of a different kind of society, a society where some things at least are owned in common uh, and uh, where wealth is shared and where the opportunity to do all sorts of good things in life, like go to college, should not depend on how much, how much money your family has. Mm -hmm. So these were the same things that were pushing people towards the idea of socialism then as they are today. And of course, they're some of those aims are realized in countries today that don't call themselves socialists, but mm -hmm. do things like complete public funding of higher education, which is true in, in many of the countries in Western Europe, especially the Nordic countries. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems also that uh, one of the great lessons is that although they didn't get exactly what they wanted, uh, a lot of what they worked for happen little by little, as you say, incrementally, there was no major revolution, but incrementally, I, I always thought that Gorbachev should have gone to the UN after, after uh, the Soviet Union collapsed and give a speech and said, well, you know, we Russians are always extremists, um, uh, but you should all be thankful that we made this 70 year experiment because now you've got a safety net everywhere and it's made uh, capitalism a much more stable, you know, society. 
it's not so it's not the same as it was before and it's partially in reaction to us that you you put all those changes into effect i think that's really true when when i was living in russia myself about 30 years ago a russian guy once said to me uh you know communism as we had it here was a disaster for the soviet people but it was a terrific thing for you folks because without yeah. it you wouldn't have Social Security and uh, Medicare and all, all sorts of other things like that. Yeah, that's, it's, it's tough for humanity to figure out where between chaos and total authoritarianism we want to land. Um, you know, but, but uh, uh, certain rules, it, it seems to me one of the main things, which is one of socialist idea, a, a basic idea of socialism, of, of sharing for your society, is that grinding up lives and, 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 and spitting them out is no way to make an economy grow. There's no way to create something more. That everybody's energy, uh, the, the more you allow those people, everyone, to be energetic and productive in their lives, the more there is for everybody, and especially if it's done intelligent, so it's not a lot of make work and stuff like that. Um, and you know, it's, it's the same thing with women, for example. If you don't let the women work, you know, you're, you've, you've forgotten one half of your resources. And it seems to me that we've already semi learned that and around the world any society that doesn't let their women work is going to be at an ever increasing competitive disadvantage to other societies you know and and in spite of all of the optimism and and the goodwill and speakers who have talked about it for a long time that underlying economic fact is probably going to be more influential mm -hmm. in changing what's going on than than the optimism but the optimism i think and, and all these speakers, all the people who talked, including Rose, you know, it had, it had a long-term effect because people got accustomed to the ideas. You know, there's, first, the ideas have to be talked about a lot. Um, and of course, when people are talking about them and they're enthusiastic, like, like uh, Eugene Debs, it, it takes a long time before the ideas uh, even partially get incorporated. Mm -hmm. so, tell us a little bit more about Eugene Debs, because he's a famous name, ran for president. Um, you had a great picture of him leaning forward, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and you make the great point that at the time, especially including Rose at the uh, ten, uh, before 1920 or so, uh, that that public speaking and it was a different style and it was a different skill, but it, it was uh, sought out across the whole country because people who could move people, um, but weren't preachers. Yeah. You know? Well, I, I, I think of all the friends of Rose and Graham, Eugene Debs is the one that I would have most liked to know. From all accounts, he was a remarkable man, uh, gentle, kindly, thoughtful. Uh, the socialism that he preached had absolutely none of the sort of harsh authoritarianism that, that the Soviet Union turned out. And quite early on in the 1920s, Debs began talking about the Vatican in Moscow, you know, laying down the rules for everybody yeah. else. Uh, that was not his way at all. Uh, he had grown up uh, poor, uh, gone to work uh, in, in railway repair yards when he was a teenager, uh, you know, were repairing engines and so forth, and worked on the trains as well. So he knew what the life of a laborer was like. And he was very influential in the Railway Workers Union, eventually became its leader. Uh, spent time in prison for strikes that he took part in. And remember, this was a time when workers didn't have the right to strike and the government you know, called out troops uh, to suppress them and, and people were killed in, in large mm -hmm. numbers. Uh, one of these railway strikes, I believe there were more than 100 people killed. Uh, Debs then became the, the perennial socialist candidate for president in uh, just about all the elections between... Um, 1904 and uh, 1920. In 1920, he got nearly a million uh, uh, votes as the socialist candidate for president while he was in the Atlanta penitentiary, mm -hmm. where he was sent for a 10-year term for speaking out against American participation in World War I. He was finally pardoned uh, after two and a half years uh, by President Warren Harding, who actually invited Debs to visit him at the White House on his way home from prison. And Debs said, you know, I ran for the White House five times, but this is the first time I've actually gotten here. So he was a man <laughs> with a sense of humor as well. 
and I think uh, wanted his vision of socialism, which was, uh, you know, one, you have to think of it as, a, you know, what, what people's vision of life under ideal Christianity would be like, something that's never right. been achieved on earth, nor has life under the kind of socialism that these people were talking about. Uh, you know, a society where everybody was treated decently, where there were not these enormous disparities of wealth, uh, where there wasn't child labor, where your opportunities in housing and education and much more uh, didn't depend on having vast amounts of accumulated wealth. And I mm -hmm. think those are still good ideals today. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, another character, uh, that's that's great on Deb's, uh, there's another character that you mentioned is John Reed. And I th thought one of your interesting stories was the big party that was thrown at, at, at Madison Square Garden or something like that in New York City that John Reed helped to organize for oh, yeah. uh, the silk manufacturers uh, that were striking. And you, you had a lot of ironies about that and that he, at the time he was uh, dating one of the, uh, another rich person, a rich woman, a, a Dodge, I think or something. Yeah. But anyway, that's a great story. Why don't you, why don't you tell that one? Well, this was uh, in 1913, the silk workers in Patterson, New Jersey, across the Hudson River from, from uh, New York went on strike. And because this was a large strike, uh, <clears throat> well over 20,000 workers on strike, and it was so close to New York, it was one in which uh, supporters from New York City, many of whom were middle and upper class, got involved in supporting the strike. They would go to Patterson, take part in demonstrations, raise money for the strikers, and so forth. And... John Reed, this wonderful uh, radical journalist, really, I think in, in many ways, just the sheer dazzle of his writing, he was the best American journalist of his time. He came up with the idea of raising money for the striking workers in Patterson, whose funds were running dry. And this was one of the things that they were afraid was going to force them to go back to work. And eventually it did. Raising money for the strikers by holding a pageant in Madison Square Garden. And Rose was involved with the committee putting the pageant together as well. And so they got more than a thousand strikers uh, and their wives to come to New York to play themselves mm -hmm. in this pageant. Uh, Reed got a painter friend of his to paint an enormous backdrop that you know spread for a hundred feet long. And then people got up and gave speeches, gave the same speeches that they had given Big Bill Haywood and others that they had actually given to the strikers. Uh, they gave these speeches to the audience. There was a mass of strikers on the stage. The audience uh, were enabled to feel that they were part of this strike as well. Uh, you know, there were songs sung in various languages. And it was kind of the high point, I think, of the identification of the American intelligentsia of the time with the labor, labor movement. Unfortunately, uh, it didn't raise any money because it's expensive to rent Madison Square Garden and uh, get floodlights that will spell out IWW uh, on mm -hmm. the roof for industrial workers of the world and get all the preparations and bring people a thousand people across the river from New Jersey. So the thing actually lost money. Uh, and then Mabel uh, pick up the bill and then they took off for Paris or her right. estate and in Paris John or something. Reed I thought was, that was a, what an end to the story. John Reed <laughs> was ha having an affair with the heiress Mabel Dodge and they uh, almost immediately went off to Europe together after the pageant was over. So people <laughs> felt a little bit le left in the lurch, but still it was a, it was a marvelous thing. And there's never yeah, been anything quite it really, uh, you know, it's like a PR you're trying to bring a lot of attention to something in a way which was effective. Um, so another character who, who was like almost as large as life as Rose is the uncle, um, yeah. who was crazy for that owned the Ansonia hotel and, and all the different things that he did in his life. I mean, you'd think Rose must've been happy that he was there to draw the family ire away from her towards somebody else. Because I think it was because every time Rose was doing things that got the family upset, 
which was all the time, you know, she would be yeah. in the, in the newspapers for, you know, taking up the cause of the, the woman who murdered the doctor, or she'd be in the nurse newspapers for speaking uh, on the stage of Carnegie hall about birth control, uh, which mm -hmm. was illegal to do at that time. And various other things in the newspaper leading a strike. Every time something like that would happen, uh, usually Uncle Will would also be in the newspaper as the object of a paternity suit or at one <laughs> point uh, he got into a fight with uh, two euphemistically called by the press chorus girls, uh, <laughs> one of whom was trying to get back from him a stash of love letters and one of these girls shot him and the two girls were put on trial for this and finally found innocent. And then they started up a vaudeville act called the shooting girls and uncle Will <laughs> went on to other things that landed him in the press, you know, a messy divorce and a spectacular child custody dispute and so forth. And at the same time, as I, as I mentioned, I think he was an ardent follower of the eugenics movement and believed that people like Rose should be kept out of the country you know, immigrants, Jews, Italians, anybody like that should be kept out of the country. Or if they were already here, they should be deported. Back to the lands where they came from. Have we heard that one recently? We certainly or, have. There's yeah. some things about this country that don't change. And it was interesting, too, the way you, you wrote it, that he was a, a, a racist and the, the four races. He said that there was a map of New York, right, that, that was colored, um, different colors for each of the four races that were uh, he considered uh, illegitimate or whatever. Actually, it wasn't he who made up this oh, map, okay. but it was a map that it just shows you something about the temper of the times. Yeah. The, some of the years in which this story takes place, you know, a lot of it takes place during the years 1917 to 21, which were years of tremendous paranoia in this country, hysteria about immigrants, hysteria about Reds, uh, while the war was on, a hysteria about Germans. And one reflection of this was that military intelligence, which spent a lot of its time spying on people within the United States, drew up a map of New York City that was an ethnic map that uh, you can find it on the internet uh, today. If you just Google ethnic map of New York 1919, it'll come up pretty soon, uh, where different colors marked neighborhoods of the city where there were blacks, where there were Irish, where there were Italian, where there were Russian Jews. And all of these people were considered dangerous by the establishment for different mm -hmm. reasons. The Italians were anarchists. The mm -hmm. Irish were nationalists who were against the, the British. The Jews were likely to be communists. Uh, the blacks should go back to the south where they belonged and so mm -hmm. forth. So these, this map was prepared as a guide to, um, actually, they, they, they even had a war plan at that time called War Plan White, which was how to mobilize the army to put down a domestic upheaval in the United mm -hmm. States. And this map was part of the arsenal of materials they had for how to control that. Another character that, you know, people... So sometimes, I mean, it's become a little bit clearer recently, but a lot of people remember President uh, Woodrow Wilson as the failed idealist who tried to get the League of Nations in. And if he had only succeeded, then we wouldn't have had World War II. That, that, that sort of image of him. But, but he's a totally different character. And, uh, you know, you quoted from when he was just a young professor on that, um, among other things. But uh, when I saw something the other day, saying, you know, is, is uh, the current president the most racist president ever? I said, you know, you're not paying any attention to history yeah. um, because he actively increased what was already going on. I mean, he, he, he upped the game a lot, I think. Um, he, yeah, he changed I the mean, rules. We unfortunately have had a lot of racist presidents in, in different ways, some yeah. overtly, some covertly. Uh, Wilson was certainly one of them. He was a Southerner. Uh, you know, he'd grown up in Georgia and Virginia, and uh, his his father, who was a, a minister, had actually ministered to Confederate troops in the Civil War. And <clears throat> Wilson himself had actually, as a boy in Georgia, seen the captured Jefferson Davis paraded 
through the streets of Atlanta by Union troops. Uh, and uh, so his his heart was very much with the South uh, in the in the Civil War and for years mm-hmm. afterwards. Uh, he was somebody who certainly had uh, uh, intensely segregationist views when it came to black people in this country. And like many, many Americans of his time, he felt that real Americans were people of Nordic or Anglo-Saxon stock and Mm -hmm. that everybody else was fake and should be kept out of the country Mm -hmm. and uh, favored immigration laws that would essentially do that. Uh, How many, what percentage of the population would have had to leave? Uh, Well over 50 or so by then, right? Well, of course, it's hard to do percentages because most of us are some mixture of all of these, these things. But certainly the percentage of people uh, who, you know, the the real thing that brought about the change, I think, in these attitudes was that starting around, starting in the late 1880s, the immigrants to this country, instead of coming from Northwestern Europe, you know, England, Germany, the low countries, and so forth, they began coming from Southern and Eastern Europe, Uh, Italy in large numbers, uh, to some extent, Greece, Eastern Euro- Europe, uh, parts of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and from Russia in large numbers, because after the that assassination of Alexander II, huge numbers of Jews, understandably, wanted to leave mm-hmm. Russia. So the the immigrants were coming from different places. There were people who spoke languages other than English. Uh, you know, some of them written in alphabets other than English, so that somebody whose ancestors had come over on the Mayflower would walk through the streets of of New York and Boston and see signs on shops that he couldn't read. And a lot of folks found this terrifying. Yeah. Uh, and I think that and was still one do. thing that fed, yeah, they still do. That's one yeah. thing that fed the eugenics movement, which was very big those days. But of course, we have other versions of it here today, right now. Mm-hmm. So, um, first, it was an excellent story that you re-brought uh, out of history, because as you said, they were an extremely famous couple. It would be like uh, 100 years from now, digging up the Prince Harry and, and uh, mm-hmm. story and, and uh, explaining why it had gotten so much attention, right? Um, well, we have a couple of uh, questions from the uh, listeners. Good. The first question we have is, did Graham and Rose have their own family? If so, did their children obtain prominent positions? No, they had no children, and yeah. neither had children from their second marriages either. Right. So uh, the next question, did Rose write during the eight years of her life after her divorce from Graham? Yes. She started writing her memoirs uh, uh, after she divorced Graham. Uh, she died before finishing them, uh, which is too bad because uh, it's mm-hmm. sort of an incomplete book, but it's still a... Uh, a quite fascinating book, which was published, as I said, about 50 years later. Uh, she is very honest about many things, such as what attracted her to Graham in the first place, and then mm-hmm. how she came to be disillusioned uh, with him. Uh, she doesn't really confront her unfortunate uh, you know, total belief in Soviet communism. She just sort of takes that for granted, never really comes to term with that, terms with that. She died um, in 1933, right? I think if I yeah. remember correctly. Yeah, so, she died so in 1933. The, the, the worst of Stalin's purges, I mean, it was already a clear to some, but the worst were, were still to come. The in worst 19- were still to come, but it was yeah. a, still a pretty grim place. You know, they'd had the, yeah. the man-made famine and so forth. Yeah. Graham's memoir, by contrast, uh, 260 pages, and he never mentions Rose. Yeah, that was a stunning thing. They were married almost 20 years or so, right? Yes, 20 yeah, that's years, a exactly, yeah. Stunning uh, deletion. Um, another One more question. Um, please comment on Isaac Newton Phelps Stokes, who was another social activist in the family. You do mention him in the book. Isaac yeah, Newton, this, this great name. Graham's, Graham's brother who was a very distinguished architect. You actually saw in that university settlement building, one of the buildings he designed. Mm -hmm. He is probably best remembered for having spent much of his share of the family fortune uh, on editing and producing a six volume uh, 
kind of encyclopedia of the architecture and history of Manhattan, uh, land use and buildings in New York City, which is still widely admired today, although you probably have to go to a rare book section of the library uh, to find it, mm -hmm. uh, did much other uh, architectural work as well. Maybe another little thing we can take a look at is her, her uh, the parents of uh, Graeme, because uh, it must have been awfully uh, testing of their tolerance to bring this, uh, you know, not just a Russian Jewish uh, daughter-in-law, but an uh, not an anarchist, but a socialist and an activist on that and birth control. And so they're always in the news, always with the family name. And, you know, they had enough of that with the uncle. But... <laughs> From a lot of the things that they said, it's very clear that they had a tough time with her, but they seem to have been restrained in that Protestant way <laughs> about yeah. their about their dislike. You know, I, so, I think you're I think you're right. They restrained their dislike. Uh, they and Rose, I think, was a good diplomat. She had a very instinctive way, which her husband certainly did not, of knowing how to deal with people who were very different than she. One of the remarkable things about the speaking that she did was you can always tell if you read over these speeches, and some of them are transcribed, uh, that she adjusted what she said to the audience. She would know how to speak in Yiddish to a group of striking factory workers, or in the, those in English that I could read, you know, she would talk about her own experience as a, as a cigar mm -hmm. worker in the factory. Uh, if she talked to a religious audience, she would use biblical par parables to make her points about equality and justice. So she knew how to deal with Graham's family. She knew their rituals. She knew that, uh, just to take one tiny little example, that if Graham's mother was about to go off on an ocean voyage, Rose should send her a basket of fruit as a going mm -hmm. present to take with her. So... Uh, they clearly got along, uh, and the, the Rose and Graham did spend quite a bit of time with the parents. They traveled with them quite often. One of Graham's siblings, a sister, also became a socialist, lifelong, and a very close friend of Rose, and remained a friend of Rose even after she separated from Graham. So Rose mm -hmm. was not the only uh, rebel in the family. Also, I would give the family some credit. Um, they were, you know, wealthy industrialists and they did build this 100 room house, but they also had a long tradition of involvement in various philanthropic causes. Graham mm -hmm. and I believe one of his siblings were both on the board of uh, Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee Institution. Other relatives had supported uh, different charities of various sorts, a lot of them to do with missionaries. So there was some tradition of philanthropic do good in the family. It was interesting that a couple of things that Rose did later on in life. Uh, for example, she went back and worked uh, under an assumed name when she was famous in a cigar factory, just to kind of go back to her roots. And, and then when she was, she went back to England um, and she had this experience where the, the, the uh, local uh, girls were telling her the story about the girl who had grown up here. I, 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 I still, that's what, yeah. really, yeah. Yeah, she, well, the, the going back to the cigar factory, this happened after uh, she got engaged to Graham. Uh, and it was curious, she'd been living in New York for nearly two years at that point, working as a newspaper reporter for this uh, Yiddish newspaper. And uh, so she was almost two years away from the cigar factory. And I think she felt that she just wanted to go back and do that work again for a little while to show that she hadn't lost touch with her class. So mm -hmm. under an assumed name, she got a job in a cigar factory in New York, worked there for a few weeks, and then unexpectedly, the news of their engagement broke in the newspapers, which was not as they had planned. The mm -hmm. chances are that uh, someone from one of these papers, which were always competing with each other for sensationalist scoops, had bribed a Western Union telegraph operator, you know, tell me about anything interesting mm -hmm. in the wires. The news broke, people at the factory recognized her, and she stopped. 
Uh, and then she did go back to England with a friend some years later to the neighborhood where she lived in London. Again, not saying who she was, but just walking through the neighborhood. And they told her the story of the uh, little girl who moved from here and went away to America and married a millionaire. <laughs> they didn't know who she was. And yeah, not knowing who she was. Well, we have one time for one last question, which is about uh, Rose's uh, ability with the media, because uh, you, you mentioned in your book that she actually was, was talented at dealing with the media. And, and the question is, um, uh, the current president was known before he ever ran for office in New York to, to be very clever about getting his name in the paper all the time. And he was, uh, the question is, how, how comparable were the methods? I don't think they're comparable at all. I didn't uh, think so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, Rose was skilled with the, uh, the media. She had been a newspaper correspondent herself. She knew what they were looking for. She welcomed any reporter who wanted to interview her. If they wanted to see the inside of her home and how she lived, uh, you know, she took them in and showed them and people did stories about this. This was when she and Graham were living together in mm -hmm. New York in much simpler circumstances than Graham's parents had lived. She also knew that, you know, when a reporter is writing a story, he or she is looking for dialogue. So at one point she was giving a speech in St. Louis and uh, the reporter had come to have breakfast with her at a hotel and she engaged the waiter in conversation in front of the reporter saying, are you a member of the union? And mm -hmm. uh, reporters eat this kind of stuff up and yeah. she knew it. So I would say she was skilled at working in the media, but she was not a manipulator of the media. <laughs> in the way that, uh, Good. Well, uh, I have one last question. I know yeah. you're, you're working on another book now. You want to tell us what your next book is going to be after this one? It's actually concentrating on that period that... Uh, I mentioned it appears in this book, 1917 to 1921, when the United States under the first, under the pressure of the first world war and then the pressure of the fear of the Russian revolution, things really went crazy in this country for a period of about four years. Uh, I think it was the most Trumpian time of American history before Trump. We mm. had widespread vigilante violence, we had widespread calls for deporting people, send them back to where they came from. Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, racial conflict on the largest scale. More black Americans died violently at white hands in those four years than at any time since the end of slavery. Mm -hmm. um, we had tremendous agitation against immigrants. And of course, you know, soon after that period came the very harsh 1924 immigration law that essentially shut the door on immigration of the United States until it was changed uh, 40 years later. So that's the period I'm writing about. Different characters, Rose and Graham are not in the book, but uh, plenty of other people are. Who oh, we're looking. Think you think you'll find interesting. We look forward to discussing it with you when you're finished and when it's ready to go. Um, and so ends another event at the Commonwealth Club in its 118th year of enlightened discussion. Thank you very much, Adam, for joining us once again. Thank you, George.